Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the great praise reports we have received this evening. We thank you, Lord God, for your constant presence in every one of the requests that have been made known. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us day by day, step by step, moment by moment. You are so faithful, and we give you praise and glory for that. We ask, Lord God, that you would continue to challenge us where we need to grow, forgive us where we fail, heal our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our emotions, that, Lord, the, the things that we do might bring honor to you. Use us for your glory. Tonight, Lord God, as we unpack a, a, what could be a thorny issue, I, I ask that you would make it clear and simple so that we can get our feeble minds around it. For you are more incredible than we can imagine. Your holiness is beyond our comprehension. Your magnitude and your person is unfathomable to us. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us your word that opens your character and nature to us. And give us, Lord, the wisdom to receive and understand that part that we're capable of. Show us who you are this night, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Bible books test. Uh, if you don't have your Bible books memorized yet, please feel free to look in the front of your Bible. There's a list there on the first few pages that will help you with the books. And let's go through the Old Testament first, then the New, beginning with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Excellent. Our question this evening is going to take us all through the Bible. So I hope you got your thumb tabs ready. The question tonight is more of a statement, but it is asking us to discuss the relationship of the Holy Spirit and Jesus during Jesus' time on earth. This is an interesting thought pattern, and this was actually all out of the same conversation that last week's question came out of. And I chose to teach them in this order because unless you understand the nature of Christ incarnate, this section on how does the Holy Spirit interact with him would be far more different, uh, difficult. So I wanted to deal this evening with how the Holy Spirit and Christ interacted during the 33 years Jesus was on earth in the flesh. Okay, so let's look at that. I want to start in Isaiah. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. And as we look at Isaiah chapter 11, I want to start in verse 1. Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, we read as follows. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. 
This is a messianic reference. So we're talking about a descendant of Jesse. And by the way, that's David's daddy. Okay, so we're talking about someone in the line of David, a stump of Jesse from the roots, the branch. I am divine branch. Okay, so the branch is a reference to Christ. This branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of might. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. I wanted to start here for two reasons. One, this is a prophetic word several hundred years before the birth of Christ that the Messiah would be dwelt in by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would rest on him. That's a word of abiding And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but in the Old Testament, what we see in the interaction of the Holy Spirit and human beings is that the Holy Spirit will come and go. He will show up and empower an individual for a prophecy or for some act or to do something, and then the Holy Spirit leaves that individual. There are only a short list of individuals in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit stayed with for a prolonged period. And so this wording that's here in Isaiah 11 is that the Holy Spirit would come and stay. It was the rest on. Okay? So that's one of the ways we would know who the Messiah was because he would be one of those on that short list of folks on whom the Spirit rested, stayed with them. The other reason that I wanted to start with this is because it also helps to unlock the character and nature of the Holy Spirit. Because you see here that this Spirit is multi-layered. When you're reading through the Scripture and it talks about the Spirit of knowledge, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. When you're reading through the Old Testament and it speaks about the spirit of counsel, you're talking about the Holy Spirit. And it's this verse that helps us to see that because as you look at Isaiah chapter 1 and Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, you have the spirit of the Lord that then gets further defined as the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So all of those attributes, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord are all attributes of the Holy Spirit. It's how we know the Holy Spirit better. And that then he, referencing back to that branch, that stump of Jesse, would delight in the fear of the Lord, in that respect between he and God. Well, where does that sphere of the Lord come from? The Holy Spirit. Because he is the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So you see that that aspect of Christ's earthly nature was inspired by, by the Holy Spirit. So then we get to jump into the New Testament. Do me a favor, before you leave here, stick something in Isaiah. Because in a little while, we're going to come back to Isaiah 61. So if you got a little card or whatever, stick it here because you're going to want to find Isaiah in a little bit. But let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, we're going to go to verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Here we're talking to Mary. It was Isaiah 11, but now we're going to Luke chapter 1. Mm Mm-hmm. Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the angel is in conversation with Mary and says, the Holy Spirit will come on you 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. There's two out of the three, friends. You've got the Holy Spirit will come and the Most High will overshadow so that the Holy One will be called, will be born and will be called the Son of God. And so you have the Trinity right here. You have the Holy Spirit, you have the Father, and you have the Son. And how does the Son in the flesh come about? By the Holy Spirit. Okay, so here you've got that his Christly form, his manly form, his divine nature is from the Holy Spirit in the flesh side, is from Mama. So you have this dual nature of the divine. He was pre-existent, so I'm not saying that he became divine in the womb. He had been there before. But what I'm saying is the transfer of his being into this manly form was in some way precipitated by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So then... You can just keep your finger here and take a note. I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, but don't turn there because we're going to come right back to another verse. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, is this same story on Joseph's side. Okay, And in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, we read, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So we have this interaction even from conception that the Holy Spirit is on this man who is Christ. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, you can turn there with me if you want to. Yeah, we're not coming back to Luke for a while, my mistake. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 and 16, and by the way, as you turn there, just want to tell you, if you ever want to have something really fun, Look at the gospel that is presented in chapter 3, verse 16 of every book in the New Testament. It's a fascinating study. We, you already know, you know, John 3, 16. You know, For God so loved the world. The gospel right there. Well, look at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized... He went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. So here at the inception of Christ's ministry, you have this physical melding of the Holy Spirit and this man. The Holy Spirit comes and alights on him, rests on him, just exactly what Isaiah said would happen. Okay, you have this picture there. So what was going on between conception and baptism? We call it normal. Okay, he just grew up as a kid. Was the Holy Spirit in him at that point? Not according to the scripture, because we have him conceived of the Holy Spirit, and yet at his baptism is when the Holy Spirit comes on him to empower him for ministry. We're not told what happened in that intervening time, but if the Holy Spirit's already there, why does he need to show up? You stop and do the math, and it, it's most likely that he grew up without the Holy Spirit in his life at those formative years because he wasn't ministering. He didn't need 
the Holy Spirit involved in his life because he was just a kid and he's growing up and he's just like the rest of us. But at his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes on him and stays on him. This same story is in John chapter 1, verses 32 through 33. Turn there with me if you want. Just write a note. John chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. In John, we find these words. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So again, you have this tie from Isaiah 11 to this event where the Holy Spirit comes. What's key to me is John's testimony. John is, after the fact, speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees that came down the mountain to see what was going on, and he gives this testimony that the Holy Spirit not only came, but remained. He didn't see the Holy Spirit leave. So this is a unique situation. This puts him in that short list because here comes the Holy Spirit that comes down on him and this voice from heaven that says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And oh, by the way, as Jesus comes up out of the water and puts his tunic back on and gets his couple of disciples and starts to walk away, the Holy Spirit stays exactly where he was on Jesus. He alighted down and remained. And that John, in his own moment of prophetic understanding, had been told by God, you'll know the Messiah as the one on whom you see Isaiah 11 fulfilled. The one that the Holy Spirit comes down and remains on. So John continues just a couple of pages later in John chapter 3, verses 30 through 36. John chapter 3, verses 30 through 36. John continues his statements on Christ and says, He must become greater. I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Here John goes into a prophetic utterance where he begins to talk about the reality that Jesus the man standing is God come down. He makes the distinction between Jesus and himself. The one who is from heaven is above all. This guy who's from the earth speaks like one from the earth. But the one from heaven is from heaven and knows all. What's fascinating to me is how quick we are to sometimes take sentences out of their context and try to apply them to us. I've seen this done in numerous sermons where it speaks from this passage that God gives the Spirit without limit. Um, friends, 
those seven verses are talking about Jesus, not us. What he says is the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives, go ahead and put him right there in that sentence, the spirit without limit. This is another key thought as you have heard me say from my studies of the whole Old Testament Holy Spirit that he always would come and go and come and go and come and go. And what John is here saying is when God poured out the Holy Spirit on Jesus, he didn't hold anything back. He got the totality of the Holy Spirit. He got the Spirit without limit. That's not the Old Testament model. And that's one of the points that I want to make, and I know this is probably going to make you jar for a half a second, but do you realize that Jesus was the last Old Testament character? It's not until His death and resurrection that we have the beginning of the New Testament. We're still under the covenant law of the Old Testament until the cross. So the entire life of Jesus is still Old Testament material. So you've got this last character, just as Samuel was the last of the judges that transfers them into the new kingdom with kings, here you have Jesus as the last Old Testament prophet who ushers in through his very death and sacrifice not only the new covenant, which is salvation through grace, but also a life with the Holy Spirit from the point of salvation without limit and without end. Yes, sir. It would have been, right. That's still under that Old Testament law because Jesus hadn't fulfilled the law yet until he rose. Until he rose. Yeah. So as we look at this verse from John chapter 3, that helps us again to understand this relationship of the Holy Spirit being with Christ without limit. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. So he's been baptized and he's come up out of the water. And in Luke chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 we're told Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Two things are going on here. First of all, we see this remaining because Jesus, on whom the Holy Spirit came and remained, now leaves and takes the Holy Spirit with him. He was full of the Holy Spirit. But not only was he leaving with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was in charge. Because this in the original Greek has the emphasis it, the actual term is akabalo, and it means to cast out. The Holy Spirit grabbed Jesus by the collar and the belt loop and threw him into the wilderness. Is really what the Greek is sharing there with this. When the Holy Spirit leads Christ into the wilderness, that's, that's the, the, the Greek word is to throw out, to cast out. The Holy Spirit went, get out there. And so Jesus is being led by the Holy Spirit into this first act of ministry, his temptation. As he's led out there, the Holy Spirit is taking him there. Now, I want you to go down a few verses, stay there in Luke chapter 4, but now I want you to look at Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. 
in verses 14 and 15 of Luke 4, we see Jesus returned to Galilee. How? In the power of the Spirit. So again, we're seeing this relationship of being together. He was led into the wilderness, and now he's returning to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And the news about him spread through the whole countryside, and he was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Why? Because he was full of the Holy Spirit. Okay? He was man, and he was God, and the man part of him was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Wow! Wow! And so, this is where I want you to keep your finger in Luke 4. And go back with me to Isaiah 61. Because in Isaiah chapter 61, there is a, another one of the Messianic prophecies. Okay, Isaiah chapter 61, starting in verse 1, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide... And it goes on and on and on and on. How does it start? The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Interesting then, as we go back to Luke chapter 4 and pick back up in verse 16, right where we just left off, Jesus, who has just returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, goes to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found Isaiah chapter 61. Okay, that's not, what, but that's what the Bible says. He unrolled it to the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. So he's quoting, he's reading Isaiah 61. And he's saying, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. And I'm going to be doing all of these things. And then he rolls up the scroll and gives it back to the attendant and sits down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue are fastened on him. And he begins teaching by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am here and I am indwelt of the Holy Spirit, and my agenda is to bring good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, set the oppressed free, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You say, wait a minute, you mentioned something about vengeance. That's the other half of that verse. Jesus stops in the middle of a prophecy because he knows which part he was fulfilling at that moment and which part he would fulfill at the end of time when his second coming. He stopped reading at the point of what he was going to do in his first coming and left the rest of it hanging because it wasn't time yet. But as he's teaching here, he's again tying these prophecies of what the Messiah would look like. An individual who was filled with the Holy Spirit and doing these acts, which is what he would spend the next three years doing. It's fulfilling that prophecy. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. Matthew 12 and 28. Jesus, in an argument with the Pharisees, has been accused of driving out demons by Beelzebub, by having a demon himself. And Jesus responds very interestingly. He says in verse 28 of chapter 12 of Matthew, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
His either or is, if I'm doing this by Satan, then Satan's destroying his own kingdom. But if I'm doing it by the Spirit of God, comma, which I am, comma, then the kingdom of God is right here among you. But again, he demonstrates his divine authority is because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do the works that he's doing. Which takes us to Romans chapter 8. Yeah, even the epistles talk about it. I figured when I started doing this study that I would only spend time in the Gospels. Because, I mean, if you're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and Jesus, you've got to have both of them in the room, and that's only in Matthew through John. Except that the writers of the epistles also picked up on what was going on in those Gospels. And so in Matthew chapter 8, as we pick up in verse 11, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, clo Romans 8, verse 11, We've come through Jesus' life from conception through ministry. In Romans, Paul makes a very interesting comment. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Remember that by the time Romans is written, Acts chapter 2 has already taken place and the people who had received the salvation of Christ also received the gift of the Holy Spirit which was now dwelling in them just as it had in Christ. And Rome, Paul is picking up in this passage in Romans, not only do we get to share in the Holy Spirit, but now that we live with the Holy Spirit in us, we've got some clue what was going on with Jesus. Because that Holy Spirit was living in him. And in fact, it was that Holy Spirit in him that raised him to life. So from conception to resurrection, the Holy Spirit plays parts in Christ's entire ministry and raises him again from the dead. Takes us to Acts chapter 10. And in Acts chapter 10... Peter is preaching. Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 37. You know what has happened throughout the providence of Judea. Beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Here Peter, the man who had walked around with him for three years, the man who by the power of the Holy Spirit said to Jesus, you are the son of the living God, you are the Christ, this man now, years later, is looking back and saying, guys, we know Jesus was it because the Holy Spirit was in him, as was prophesied in Isaiah 11. Okay. Which then takes us to Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29. Hebrews 10 and 29. In this book, the writer is sharing his ideas on Christ, the ideas on the Messiah, to Hebrews. Hello. He's talking to Jews all around the world. So he's writing to people who understand the law, who understand the Old Testament. And he's making an argument for Christ's high priesthood 
But it's interesting what he says here in verse 29 of chapter 10. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Ooh. Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them? Wow. So here we have Jesus as the Son of God and also that His blood establishes the new covenant. But look how the sentence ends. And who has insulted the Spirit of grace. Oh, wait, that's the Holy Spirit. So by denying Christ... You are trampling underfoot the Son of God, the Creator of the Covenant, and the Carrier of the Holy Spirit. You're not only insulting Christ, you're insulting the Holy Spirit that empowered Him because they're together. And I use that word intentionally. Together. Not one. And this is where it gets hard for us as human beings. When we think of person, we think of soul, body, heart, mind, emotion, unity. To have three persons in one essence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the one God... We, we've got no experience for that. We can't make that make sense. We can't justify that in our own logic. We have a trouble with that. And what's being shown here is that the Holy Spirit is alongside the Son of God. And they're working together. We know that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, but in personhood they are not. They are still distinct as Holy Spirit, Father, and Son. And so what this is really talking to is this idea of when you slap God, the Holy Spirit gets a bruise. Okay? Because they're together. Okay? So my conclusion this evening... We'll discuss the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Christ during His time on the planet. Now you can, I think, understand why it was imperative that we have the conversation we had last week first. Because we have to understand an accurate picture of the nature of Christ. And as we talked last week, the church understands the scriptures to present what we call the hypostatic union. That in some miraculous and unique way, the person of Jesus Christ on earth had a dual nature. Not a blended nature, but two side-by-side -side natures. He was fully God and fully man at the same time. That one did not overshadow the other, one did not limit the other, one did not expand the other. He was both simultaneously. Remember that Jesus is this Old Testament character in his flesh. <laughs> It's also an Old Testament character in his divine nature because the Bible's full of God in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is one of, or God is one of the Old Testament characters. <laughs> he shows up all through the book, like verse 1 and following. So we have Jesus' life, his ministry, and his sacrifice that creates our New Testament understanding. So it's important for us to keep in mind that in the Old Testament, this Holy Spirit would come and go. Let me give you some examples. The prophets. As you go back and start reading through the prophets in the Old Testament whether that's in Samuel or whether that's, you know, you're looking at Elisha or Elijah or whether you're talking about the, 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 the writing prophets that we have, Joel and Amos and Obadiah and all those. As you read them, they won't claim to have the Holy Spirit. They will claim to be visited. And the word of the Lord came upon me and gave me this word. 
It's not like they were in touch and getting constant communication. The Holy Spirit would show up, dump a message on them, and bail. The Holy Spirit did not stay. He visited. Probably the best example that I can think of actually comes out of the judges, and that would be Samson. As you read through Samson's story, it's the Holy Spirit came upon him and he did this. And then you get some more of the story, and then the Holy Spirit came upon him and he did that. And then you get some more of the story, and then the Holy Spirit came upon him and he did, whether it was tearing a lion in half, or whether it was getting a thousand foreskins, or whether it was beating a bunch of guys, or not a thousand foreskins was David, but anyway, beating a thousand men to death with a donkey's jawbone, or whether it was picking up a city gate and walking off with it, or whether it was jumping up and whooping the Philistines that were trying to take his power away with Delilah. Each of the story points where he does some miraculous thing is prefaced with, and the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was able to. Because the rest of the story, he didn't have the Holy Spirit. He didn't need that power at those points. It's actually Joel chapter 2 that gives us one of the messianic prophecies of what would happen when the Christ came. And in Joel chapter 2, he gives the prophecy that God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. It's a beautiful word picture. Because to pour out one's spirit, have you ever taken a jar of water and poured it out? Get it back in that jar, I dare you. If God is going to pour out His Spirit, it's not coming back. It's coming to stay. Okay, So it's an interesting word image that Joel gives. Okay? Now, I, I said before, there are some exceptions in the Old Testament. I want to give you three that I could just find really quickly. It's probably not a complete list, but I'd have to go. That's another study in itself. Moses, during his entire leadership, the last 40 years of his life, the Holy Spirit is on him. There are two or three different times. Like, for example, when the 70 elders are put in position and they start to prophesy and Joshua runs up to him and says hey there's a couple outside the camp that are prophesying are you going to do anything to stop them and he says I wish that everyone had the spirit of God on them like I do see Moses was living under the Holy Spirit's guidance his entire leadership of that 40 years it's also interesting that God says to Moses to choose Joshua as his successor, but the interesting thing is that Joshua is described as a man on whom the Holy Spirit rests. So we think Moses and Joshua, both because they were in that leadership role of the people of Israel during pivotal times, not as a king, but as a God leader, the Holy Spirit was on them to guide. The next one, the third one that I would share with you, would be David. David has, there, are, there are references to David having the Holy Spirit rest on him, stay with him, guide him. Okay. So as we put that whole picture together, then we get this very unique situation again with Jesus as his human nature receives the benefit of the fullness of the Holy Spirit throughout the years of his ministry and sacrifice. As I was considering this, my mind went back to the Old Testament motif of what does a father give the eldest son so that he can rule the household? Anybody other than my wife? We call it the double portion. Here we have the Son of God and the Holy Spirit, the double portion of God's divinity in a single human being walking around, given by the Father. 
fascinating word picture there. I don't know how far we can go with it, and I'm not saying anything more. It's just one of those interesting, well, that's, that's an interesting thought. The same Holy Spirit that empowered him in his ministry empowers us in ours. You want to make yourself different than Jesus because you're not the Son of God. But I would remind you that Peter on, in Acts chapter 2, as he was explaining to the folks what was happening with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, told everyone when they asked, what should we do? He said, repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. That same Holy Spirit that was working in Him is the same Holy Spirit that's working in you. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? He lives within you. And again, we all want to say, well, you know, I can't do some of the things that Jesus did because... Come on, man. He was the Son of God. Now, I remind you that Jesus, when his disciples said, Man, you do some incredible things, laughed, looked them square in the face, and said, You think this is good? You will perform greater miracles than me. How in the world could we do that? We're not dual nature, divine Son of God. No. We are filled with the same Holy Spirit He was. And what we are capable of is only limited by our lack of faith. Everything Jesus did, we have the power to do for the kingdom of God. What we lack is the wisdom to recognize kingdom opportunities like he did so that we call on the power of God to complete the work of God in the kingdom of God through the creation of God. We try to use the Holy Spirit to our benefit instead of the kingdoms. And we wonder why it doesn't work. When we get in lockstep with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, filled with His Spirit. We are following the divine nature while being empowered by the Holy Spirit Himself. So the relationship that the Holy Spirit had with Christ is the same relationship the Holy Spirit wants with you. Heavenly Father, as we close this evening, Help us to absorb the huge truth I just spoke. Lord, we so limit your ability to correct what is wrong in our world. We fear death and we cringe from disease when you have given us the power of the Holy Spirit. We fear not being popular and, and we, we don't want to cross any social barriers. And God is for us. Who can be against us? Lord, we have the opportunity in following You to do greater things. Lord, as the centurion, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. Help us to see the world from your perspective and to not be surprised at your magnificence and power. And we'll thank you for it through Christ our Lord. Amen.